If you have your Bibles, we are in the book of Proverbs, as we have been throughout this summer. And Proverbs is an interesting book to preach. It is not laid out like a lot of the other books that have actual themes and paragraphs. It's kind of scattershot. So instead of going through, say, a letter of the Apostle Paul and going through a paragraph and just kind of uh, unfolding it, with Proverbs, I kinda, it's, it's like having a water hose and I'm just spraying you with Proverbs because you have to pick a theme and then just find all the little Proverbs here and there. So I'm, I'm going to get the water hose just spraying you down with Proverbs this morning as we have been. Look at it that way. It's kind of funny when you think of it like that. But anyway, we have looked at uh, several of the themes that, that uh, come from Proverbs, the heart, the tongue, the job. Today we're looking at encouragement or counsel. I'm not even sure really what to call it. I've been struggling all week with, not with the message, but what to call the message. Uh, it says encouragement in your bulletin, and that's about as close as I could get. But the idea of good counsel that helps us, being a friend who is a help, is really what we're talking about. Uh, that idea of encouragement. Proverbs 15.22 says, Without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. Proverbs 1.5, the introduction, says, A wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. The fact is we need each other. As people, as Christians, we need friends that help. We all need people in our lives that can come alongside of us and listen to us and help us and sometimes admonish us, sometimes take us to task when we need it, and sometimes pick us up when we are down. That, that's all the, the kind of thing we're talking about today. I'll call it encouragement, but it covers a lot of things. And it covers a lot of things that we all are in need of. And by the way, this is ancient wisdom. This is 3,000-year-old wisdom written by Solomon that rings true today for humans as much as it did back when it was written. And the truth is, uh, we need people. There, there's a lot of Christians that think you can do it as a lone ranger, just me and God, me and the Holy Spirit. That's all we need. But our faith is really not designed that way. The Holy Spirit is not a one-on-one -on -one person. When we're born of the Spirit, we are born into a body. And we are destined to be a fellowship of people that is there to help and support one another. The uh, epistles of the New Testament talk about this over and over and over again. The need we have for one another. And God works and speaks through other people as much as any other way, probably more so. So this is an important thing. Encouraging counsel is what I'll call it. Why is it important? Well, we're going to just start out, and I'm going to start spraying you with Proverbs. First of all, encouraging counsel can bring healing in the time of hurt. Look at Proverbs chapter 12. And we're going to read verse 18 and verse 25. Proverbs 12, verse 18 says this. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword but the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's the power of our mouths. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks back with the tongue. Our words can be like swords that stab people, or they can bring healing, as it says there in verse 18. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Move down a few verses to verse 25, where it says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. We have the ability to bring healing to others. By the way, that's what we're talking about in our community right now, and with these kids especially who are dealing with this, this loss out of the blue of a, a very young man. Uh, there's a need for healing. The right kind of words can help. They can be used with that. We all have hurts. We all have failures. We all have things that quietly torment us. That's the nature of the human race. We're all there. We need friends that can help. And good friends, good counsel can help bring healing in those situations. And we all need it. Don't think you can do it alone. That's kind of, you know, the American way. It's really the human way. The human sin is pride. Let's face it, that, that is our issue. That's our downfall, pride. And especially the American way. You can do it on your own. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps, and you don't need anybody. Not so. That's not the way it is in reality, and certainly not the way it is in the church of Jesus Christ. We need people around us to bring healing 
at those times. We need those people that can support us in making good decisions. Look back at uh, Proverbs 11:14. Should be just on the next page back. It says, where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. We can be helped in succeeding through looking to other people. In fact, the smart person will do this. When we remodeled our house, there's a bathroom downstairs that needed total remodeling. And I didn't get a lot of help. I just, with my own brain, because I'm smart enough, went out and we found things cheap, found some flooring cheap at Menards, found a shower that would fit in that was cheap, and we got it done. 10 or 11 or 12 years later, the floor looks, <laughs> has all kinds of different colors that seep through somehow in that cheap flooring. And the sheetrock is peeling off the walls around the shower because I learned later, those kind of showers always leak. Someone told me they always leak. They never don't leak. <laughs> yeah, he was right. Lesson learned. Seek some counsel and you will make wiser decisions. We need people, don't we? It's a good idea. Others can help us get direction. Flip over to Proverbs 15. Again, just a few pages over. Everything's just a few pages over in Proverbs. Proverbs 15 and verse 22 says this. Without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. It's, it's another, another one of those, uh, very much the same thing as one before. The idea is the bigger the issue, the more you need counsel. Don't be afraid to go to others. Lay aside that pride and recognize, you know what, we need help to get through this life. And the more important the decision, the more we need it and the more people we need. It brings wisdom, this thing we have with good friends. Proverbs 12, flip back there. I'm spraying you with Proverbs. 12, 15 is the next one. which says, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Flip over another page to Proverbs 13, 10. Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Want to hear some more? How about Proverbs 19, 20? Flip over there. Give you your finger exercise today. I'm the guy with the fire hose, just spraying you. Proverbs 19.20 says this. Listen to counsel and accept discipline, and you may be wise the rest of your days. We will be the wiser for having people around us who will tell us the truth and who will share the wisdom that they've learned. And some of you who have been through extremely difficult things, you wonder why when you're in the midst of it. Our community right now is wondering why. Why? There's one thing I know for sure. If you've been through something really, really difficult, you have an ability to be a counselor later down the road to those going through the same things like nobody else. You become a gift in those situations because we need people to come alongside of us in those kind of things. I can remember uh, many, many years ago here in this church, there was a difficult time we were going through, and we had some people who were in the process of leaving our church who were in leadership positions. There were some disgruntled people, and, and it was not easy. And after they left, there was a congregational quarterly meeting, like the one coming up in just about a week or so, and they decided to come back and just kind of their, their parting shot was uh, sharing exactly what they felt about everything in this church and they shared that quite bluntly and walked out the door. Uh, much of it, not even true. Much of it that had some truth was uh, inaccurately deflected. And it was one of those days I went home, and as you can imagine, I didn't sleep that night. I was tossing and turning, and by the end of the day, I had made up my mind exactly what they needed to be told. And I was going to charge right into the office and get on the phone, and I was going to tell them what they needed to hear. On the way to church, now two miles from my house to church, on the way to church, one of our wise people saw me driving and literally pulled me over and came to the window and said, Bob, how you doing today? And I looked at him and said, they had no right to say what they said last night. And he said, yeah, that's true. But that's okay. 
you going to the office? And I said, yes, I'll be there. So he followed me right up to the office, sat down, and put me in perspective, saying, you know what? Everyone who was here saw where they were coming from. Uh, there was no point in lashing out. There was no point in reacting. That it was okay. It was just it settled the situation quite well. There was no nobody had any question anymore where they were at and, and those kind of things. And I thought, you know what? What wisdom. I was ready to go and do something dumb. But someone, a brother, a wise brother, pulled me aside and said, No, let's let's do this a little more wisely. We need those things. We need friends that help. Many times in our lives, we need healing and direction and guidance and wisdom. Don't think you're smart enough and good enough to do it on your own. You need some people. Now, you don't need a lot, especially those who are going to share some, some personal things. Don't do that with everybody. When the Bible says confess your sins to one another, don't get up here in front of the church and lay out your dirty laundry. It's just not wise. But make sure there's somebody that you can trust, that you can do that with. Very, very important to help us gain perspective. So the next question this begs is, well, okay, what, how do we do that? Because if we need those things, then we also have to be those things. So what does Proverbs, what does this 3,000-year-old wisdom have to tell us about being an encourager? Well, it does have some things to say. So we'll continue the spray. Proverbs 11:13. Go back to that. Proverbs 11.13 says, He who goes about as a tale-bearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. Do you know what the first thing you need to have if you want to be a counselor who helps, a friend who helps? Confidentiality. Don't be a talker. When you get some juicy details about somebody else, keep it to yourself if you want to be a friend. Because if you don't, you're not going to have people coming to you for help very much longer. One of the things you have to have with someone who can really be a friend who helps you and is honest is uh, confidentiality. The ability to keep your mouth shut about juicy details that you know and others don't. I'll be honest with you, as a pastor, I wish I didn't know as much as I do. But I can't tell it. It just wouldn't work. Also, there's a sensitivity that's needed. Flip over to Proverbs 15. A few pages over. Proverbs 15 and verse 23 and then verse 28. 1523 says this, a man has joy in an apt answer. How delightful in a timely word. And then the other one is 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. That timely word and knowing when to speak and knowing when not to speak. Do you want to be a friend who helps? Be a listener. Slow to talk, quick to listen. Hear a person out before you give advice. Find out where they're coming from. Make sure it's the right time. I can remember again, I'll, I'll share, I have to share situations way back, you know, to share here. I've been here 28 years, and I know why pastors don't stay this long usually. You have so many sermon illustrations you cannot use because the people are sitting out there looking at you. So I have to go way back. See, that's a little safer. Then there's a couple out there that are going to remember. But there was a situation with a, a, a difficulty in our congregation, and there was, we were considering discipline uh, on a member. And uh, I was instructed as pastor to go and share and, and exactly what to share with him. I went, and as I talked, I, it became very apparent to me that it was not time to share that with him. I mean, I could have, but it wasn't going to do any good. It wasn't going to help. It was just going to drive this person away. And it may have been good for the pride of the church. Well, we don't let that stuff happen. We, we challenge it and deal with it. But it, if the purpose is to help, it wasn't time yet. And I'll never forget that. I got some flack after that because, why didn't you share? It wasn't time. No, we got to tell them the truth. Well, we do. But let's wait till he's ready to hear it. Sometimes when you're in those kind of situations, it's not time to talk. It's just time to listen. And... Figure out exactly where they're coming from. And if you do that, you will be able to give 
timely advice. Remember what it says there in verse 23 of Proverbs 15, a man has joy in an apt answer. How delightful is a timely word. It's fools that speak too soon. Being an encouraging counselor means sometimes just waiting for the right time. Proverbs 25 says this, a plan in the heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out. Being willing to patiently sit with somebody and listen to somebody to figure out the depth of what's really going on, that is a true encourager, an encouraging counselor. And one of the main things we have to look at in this situation is honesty. Flip over to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. And in this chapter, we are looking now at verses 24 and 26. Proverbs 24, 24. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, people will curse him and nations will abhor him. Well, in verse 25, but those who rebuke the wicked will be a delight and a good blessing will come upon them. He kisses the lips who gives a right answer. That's almost poetic, isn't it? He kisses the lips who gives a right answer. Honesty. The one who tells the, uh, uh, the wicked you are righteous does him no good. Someone who doesn't tell somebody the truth, maybe to encourage them, does not encourage them rightly. Honesty. Friends will be honest with other friends. Someone who really loves you will tell you the truth and not what you want to hear. Because, by the way, especially when we're struggling, truth isn't always what we want to hear. It takes a real friend to tell you the truth. Now, having said that, if you're going to be a truth teller, make sure that you have the friendship built up and the right to do it. Otherwise, you'll have no success. Telling the truth is for people that have earned the right to have that truth received by a built-up account of love and friendship. But real friends will be honest. And you know, we're called in the body of Christ to be honest, right? Speaking the truth in love. That in love part's very important, but so is the speaking the truth part. We should be a fellowship that has the right to challenge and admonish one another and to tell the truth when we need to hear it. The last thing we'll look at is love, obviously. Do we even have to say it? Love. Look at verse 27, 9. It doesn't we use the word love specifically, but that's what it's talking about. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. So is a man's counsel. So a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. To love someone is to bear with them, to stick with them. By the way, that's something that many people in this day and age of church hopping miss. We live in a consumer society, and we take that into our, our spiritual lives, and we want to look for the church that is just right for us and look down the menu. We like this kind of music and this kind of preaching and this kind of format and this kind of style, and we forget what the church is. It is a relational thing with people, and all those other things are really peripheral. They're not unimportant, but they're peripheral ultimately. It's how we relate to one another. And what you see many times in Scripture in talking about the love is bear with. Do you know what bear with implies? It ain't going to be easy. Bearing with is not a fun thing. It means you just got to gut it out with people, but you do. Because that's what love is. Sometimes in marriage, married folks, we have to bear with our partner, don't we? What's the alternative? It's part of love. So being an encourager, keeping confidence, being sensitive, being honest, and above all, loving. We all need each other. We need people. We need wise counsel. We need help. We need healing. We need direction. We need support. And to do that, we have to be honest and loving and sensitive and confidential. Now here's the other side of it. The Holy Spirit is ultimately our counselor. If we don't have any people, God is enough. 
but God most often works through people. The Holy Spirit works through the people in whom he lives. And the Holy Spirit is called the counselor, the comforter, literally the one who comes alongside of us, which is exactly what we're talking about this morning. Because of the Holy Spirit living within us, every one of us has the potential to be that to another person. So I guess this is one way of asking, how's your love life? Not talking about romantic love. We automatically jump to that in our society. But how's your love life? What kind of a friend are you? And the other thing to ask, are you in your pride going this thing alone when you do so much better with some good, honest, loving counsel? There's people out there. You just have to find them. This is part of what it is to be in the body of Christ. And of course, we are here in the body of Christ for only one reason. God came to us, and Jesus, God in the flesh, bore our sin and died on the cross for us that we might be forgiven and redeemed and brought into this family and given this Holy Spirit. And one thing we do regularly with the church all over the world and down through the past ages of history is remember that through the Lord's table that we're doing this morning. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the fact that Jesus Christ gave his life and shed his blood so that we might have life ourselves. It's a reminder that it's not about us. We're not here because we're good enough or we were smart enough to believe a gospel instead of reject it. It's that we are all hopelessly, we're all hopelessly lost until God came to us. And as we take this bread and as we drink this cup, we remember that it's only because someone freely gave it to us and we stand on level ground and it's all by grace.